the interview of Brennan Malusian. This interview is being conducted by Lucas Schroeder from the Wright State University Veterans Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at Brennan Malusian's apartment in Dahlonega, Georgia. It is 9.15 p.m. on 27th of February, 2017. <clears throat> All right, so where and when were you born? I was born on October 8th, 1992, in a really small town of Taylor Mill, Kentucky. <clears throat> All right, um, now, is that in like the northern part of Kentucky, whereabouts? So, yeah, it, it is. It's in the northern part of Kentucky. Uh, it's right as soon as you get, uh, if you're traveling from Ohio with Cincinnati into Kentucky, it's maybe uh, 10 minutes uh, across the Ohio to Kentucky border. It uh, borders with Covington and Newport. Okay. <clears throat> um, so who are your parents and what were their occupations? Or what are their occupations? My father's name is Patrick Malugin, and he is a stockbroker for Fidelity Investments. My mother's name, uh, maiden name is uh, Lauren Bobbitt. Uh, she remarried after divorcing with my father. It is now Lauren Needring House, and she's been uh, job to job as a financial advisor for insurance companies. Okay. Um, do you know offhand like what kind of insurance companies that she worked for? Well, she used to work, uh, ironically enough, she used to work at Fidelity Investments as a uh, financial broker as well in specialty, spe specialty trading. And uh, then she learned and worked for, I believe the company's name is ADP, AD uh, for insurance. All right. Do you have any siblings? If so, what do they do? I do have siblings. I'm uh, one boy of five sisters. All of them, except one, are students. The one sister that is working, my oldest sister, Farron, is uh, managing hotels. She's currently managing the Millennium Hotel in downtown Cincinnati. Okay. Um, what about the other sisters? Uh, they're all younger sisters. Uh, all of my sisters are uh, half-sisters, and they're all currently students. The other closest sister in age to myself is my 19-year-old sister, Jillian, and she's currently living at home with my father, has a baby, and is attending uh, college at the local community college. Okay. <clears throat> um, has any of, has your older sister, did she serve at all? She did not. I'm actually one of the, uh, I'm the only male of my generation in my family to include my cousins to serve in the armed forces. However, all other males in my family, in my immediate bloodline, besides my father, has served in some form, shape, or aspect, including my step-grandparents. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, so, uh, now, what made you actually, uh, want to... Um, join the military. So it always been a passion of mine. I, it is something that I grew up with. I grew up in the lifestyle of hearing the stories of my grandparents talking about World War II and my grandfather was in Pearl Harbor. Um, so hearing all of those throughout my life um, in China just being surrounded in very much the culture with not being associated with a military installation made me want to join and I was always told however you should go and at least try college first. You should try school. You don't want to be enlisted. That's not the route to go. Go try ROTC and all that, um, which I'm sure leads into the next series of questions you might have as to uh, what I did before I joined. I uh, graduated high school in 2011, and I really wasn't doing a whole lot with my life. I was going to the University of Cincinnati. I had been living in an apartment with a couple of my buddies, and I'd been working in a downtown restaurant called Nada. And so I had ended up getting so frustrated with school that I dropped out of the University of Cincinnati to go enlist. Okay. And um, which branch of military service did you actually enlist into? The Army. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, where did you uh, train, do your basic training at? Uh, so I did my basic training at Fort Leonard Wood. I was originally supposed to be a uh, 13 Fox, a Ford Observer when I went to uh, MEPS, but as you and anybody watching this video might know by now, you never get what you try to go to for MEPS. Um, and the guy at MEPS that was helping me came back and said, sorry, the 13 Fox slots are full for the bonus. I said, well, if I don't get the bonus, I don't want the job. The jobs they offered to me were uh, the most exciting jobs that I thought there were around. I was offered the job of a petroleum fuel specialist, chaplain's assistant, cable layer, in some other job, regardless of scoring in the alpha zone of my ASVAB. 
So I uh, told the guy there at MEPS, uh, you know, thank you, have a nice day, sir. I appreciate you helping me out, but I'm not interested in listing. And he said, what would it take to get you in list? And I said, how about airborne? I want airborne school my contract. I want to be a paratrooper. I want to jump out of planes. And the gentleman uh, left the room and then came back in a few minutes later and said, well, son, I got you uh, airborne school in your contract. You're going to be a paratrooper, but you're going to have to be a military police officer. And that's the day I signed my contract. All right. Um, so now where did you go to basic training at? Uh, so I attended basic training at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I was there for approximately six months because I was a holdover for my, my that airborne that I had in my contract before going to Fort Benning. Um, I didn't know if you wanted me to talk about uh, potentially things that happened at Fort Benning as far as my injury was concerned. Um, so now what was your uh, experience at basic training like? My experience at basic training was one that I'm sure every veteran will say will stick with me the rest of my life. I truly believe I was at the tail end of what veterans refer to as old army consistently. Uh, I know that no matter who you talk to, a veteran's always going to say, well, back in my day. However, uh, smartphones weren't really a huge thing. They were just taken off. So and we didn't we, we had a lot of old school mentality drill sergeants with us. Um, and especially my platoon, we had our kill hat as our uh, platoon sergeant. We had him and one female as our primary drill sergeants, um, even up until AIT, because our other drill sergeant had been um, going to ALC, I believe was the school that he was attending. So I had a very on-hand experience as to what I feel uh, infantry went through in their basic trainings, because we had the blue disc drill sergeant going through as our primary drill sergeant. So it's an experience that I'll never forget. And I hate that man more than anything, but I kind of respect him more than anybody because I learned more there than I believe that I did in the four years that I attended high school. Um, so now you said you were in ROTC. Was basic training anything like you expected? Was it anything like ROTC? So I was only at the University of Cincinnati for a quarter. Um, and at that time I was taking uh, two ROTC classes and I was doing a little bit of drill and ceremony stuff with them there at the RTC department, but I was never contracted as a cadet. I was just a tag-along type of cadet. Um, as far as basic training is concerned, I feel everybody should attend a basic enlisted training, even if they go through Bullock. It's a very eye-opening uh, experience, and it's a very humbling experience when you're sitting out there in the middle of winter in frozen dirt trying to dig a, a foxhole in the middle of Missouri. So other than the uh, infantry drill sergeant that you uh, mentioned, was there any other of your drill sergeants that really stuck with you that you like keep in contact with or that had just a big impact on your army career? So I would say all of my drill sergeants, as cliche as it sounds, had some type of form, way, shape, or impact on me. Um, the infantry drill sergeant, drill sergeant Reed, uh, had the biggest impact on me. And even after we had graduated, we were holdovers. Influenced me a lot, being uh, the background, the combat infantry, airborne personnel. He had spent his whole entire time in the army at Fort Bragg previously, become uh, becoming a drill sergeant. But other than that, my other drill sergeants, even my female uh, drill sergeant, really inspired me. I know a lot of people are really quick to shut out the female drill sergeants right now around this time. Uh, however, I completely believe in equal opportunity, and she showed us that females can meet the male standards, that females can compete with males, uh, and that's not always the case in the active army, but there in that training environment, she really inspired me to, to stop those generalizations of females and to give them the same opportunities to meet the standard um, as the standard and not as the female standard. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, you said your job was a military police officer. Um, what was that like? Being like going through the training, just like specifically for like military police. Okay, so just the training portion. Mm -hmm. um, so the training was different. It was once again you get this notion of um, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. You know, I'm here to uphold law and law and order, and you really get to discover what it means to be a law enforcement officer. You know, it's not always the uh, giving uh, warrants, and, you know, sort of serving warrants and, and kicking in doors and all that stuff. It's the hours of meticulous paperwork. It's the skills of being able to articulate exactly what happened in your reports 
the interactions with people and building those relations with the community uh, that really came out that was, hey, this is part of the job. It may not be in the job description, but if you want to be good at what you do, this is what you have to do. All right. Um, so you said you went to airborne school. Uh, yeah. Do you want to elaborate on your time in airborne school? My time in airborne school changed me forever. Um, I went from being an adolescent kid, not really doing a whole lot with my life, to enlisting in the army, to learning the core values of the military. And when I got over to airborne school was uh, just when they were transitioning from uh, T-10 and T-11 to T-11 only, uh, which is the types of parachutes. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting that we still got to go through all the T-10 training. We got to jump with T-10s. Unfortunately, I had an accident on my fifth jump, which is the last required jump to get your uh, jump wings, where the uh, personnel behind me had cross-checked me into the door because uh, he was riding my parachute or my pack tray too closely. And the static line, which opens my parachute, wrapped around my arm and I became a toe injury um, on the plane, uh, so basically after it wrapped around my arm and I had to exit the door from getting cross-checked, the cable was tied around my bicep and pulled me against the side of the plane, uh, splitting my bicep in half, my left bicep here, and uh, basically disabling my arm. And I just remember falling to the ground and uh, luckily enough I was able to, to, to land um, with no parachute malfunctions and I could see the burn mark across my arm and I couldn't move my arm. Uh, I had to have surgery on uh, bicep reconnection surgery and I was told I was going to be uh, chaptered out of the army medically uh, for this injury and that I would never be able to move my arm past 30 degrees again. Uh, fortunately enough for me, uh, I was really dedicated in staying in and getting through the physical therapy and the occupational therapy and I was consistently trying to prove the doctors wrong. And because I proved the doctor wrong and I was able to move my arm again above the 30 degree mark, I was able to go ahead and stay in the army and complete airborne school only after being held there for almost a year before arriving at a unit in Fort Bragg. So now um, they still uh, gave you completion for airborne school or were you just completely held back since So the because it was my fifth jump, and I successfully landed on the ground after exiting the aircraft, even after being towed. Uh, luckily enough, we hit a hot air pocket. I, the plane lifted up, and I was able to come undone. After I hit the ground, uh, and on the way down, I was screaming in pain, but as soon as I hit the ground, and a black hat or an airborne school instructor ran over to me, and the very first question I asked him was, did I get my wings? Uh, and the response was, uh, yes, dumbass, you got your wings. Now shut up and take your top off. And uh, then after that, I was able to take my top off very loosely, and they were able to start examining the wound. Okay. Um, other than that, was there any other sort of uh, specialized training that you went through? Um, any sort of like special, special military police schools that you've attended? No, so I got to do a lot of uh, side certifications, not schools per se, that you go to. However, I've conducted training with the FBI. Uh, I've conducted classes as, as far as uh, going and hunting down um, the felons and bringing them back to, to justice. Mostly it was AWOL training uh, to go recover AWOL soldiers. A lot of smaller certifications like that, a lot of uh, school shoot houses and things like that, but no uh, real type of formal schooling. Okay. <clears throat> um, so how did you adapt to military life, um, like IE? the whole physical part, um, living in the barracks, if you live in the barracks, as well as like food at the defect, and as, as far as like social life. Okay, so uh, social life wasn't that big of a difference for me, um, moving into the barracks. Uh, being at that Fort Benning after my injury for almost that year period, I, think, I believe it was about 11 months, um, I lived in an open bay barracks with new student classes coming in, consistently in and out, and there's no privacy in an open bay barracks. It's a double bunk bed. I had one of the bottom bunks. My, my locker was here on my left hand side and then it was anybody could see anything anytime anywhere uh, you know, with the, consistently with the other beds. I quickly adapted to that and kind of learned people were going to stare at me even with the cast and then my big bionic arm that they gave me kind of attached after my injury. So that kind of uh, adapted me to living that open bay lifestyle. However, when I moved to the barracks at Fort Bragg and I got to the unit there in the 503rd, 
Uh, barracks life was easy for me. Um, it was uh, very much being an adult, clean up after yourself, cook, clean, take care of yourself, shower every day. These are basic concepts that I guess more of the 18 year old kids right out of high school kind of had more uh, problems uh, transitioning to because I had lived on my own and operated on my own before I joined the Army. Mm -hmm. um, you want to elaborate a little bit more into like what you did on a day-to-day -day basis while you were at Benning, since you obviously couldn't do your job as a military police officer? Yeah, so um, interesting enough, I got to do a lot of uh, admin work. I know that doesn't sound super exciting, but I, it grew me a lot. Uh, basically, I was the only, myself and only one other lower list person below the rank of sergeant were in that whole battalion working. So I was working alongside with staff sergeants, sergeant first classes every day, um, seeing what a platoon sergeant does, seeing what their job is, uh, literally working at the same desk as them on a different computer, typing up reports for a battalion, brigade, to report to a ranger team brigade once they took over um, our unit. And so it was just a lot of uh, uh, like supply, learning how supply tracks everything, how they... Uh, all the forms, the administrative stuff that goes with that. So I got a lot of management skills out of it. And I got to see both what a good leader um, consisted of and what a bad leader consisted of and kind of what to stay away from doing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, so did that experience there carry over to your experience at Fort Bragg? Absolutely. Um, I I learned, I can't even say, I couldn't put a number on how many leadership skills I learned while I was at Benning. Uh, even with my injury, don't get me wrong, there were days that uh, I was hating life and sucking hard, uh, doing more flutter kicks and more bicycle kicks than uh, I can even tell you a, a, a cyclist. But I learned through those mistakes. I learned being at that infantry unit for so long at Fort Benning, uh, it, how day-to-day -day operations are supposed to work, how op orders are supposed to work, how uh, pre-jump is supposed to be announced and uh, pronunciated and uh, how to do all the airborne nomenclature so that way when I got to my unit at Fort Bragg um, at the time not knowing I would not be allowed to be back on airborne status know how to be a jump master what it took I sat in on a lot of jump master classes and I sat in on a lot of pathfinder classes hoping that my receiving unit could send me as soon as I was eligible okay. so <clears throat> now what was day-to-day uh, -day life uh, consist of at Fort Bragg as far as your uh, job consisted of? Fort Bragg was uh, very hit or miss uh, as far as the days were concerned because a military police officer, our schedules were never in sync uh, and consistent. It was very much a, we could do a day called platoon duty, which we would go in like a regular army day. We'd be at first formation, conduct uh, physical fitness, go back, shower, eat breakfast in our room. Since we we're MPs, we don't eat the defect. We're given an extra stipend to eat outside and cook on our own. And then I report back to work and we do the day-to-day -day army operations such as uh, uh, doing maintenance checks on our trucks, uh, doing inventory, conducting training depending on how many people we have there. And other days could be uh, you're working midnight shift in uh, patrol, responding to domestic violence cases, and end up having to work almost two days in a row because somebody didn't show up on uh, the day shift or the morning shift for uh, gates. So you, instead of turning in, uh, you literally uh, jump back in line to go out to one of the gates and unfortunately have to work one of the gates. It was a very hectic life. It was very much a disorganized because uh, when you think about a, an army unit and its cohesion, our company, we only have one battalion there at Fort Bragg, our company is never together. Each platoon is separated into each one of these different shifts. So we're never in, really in the same place at the same time together. So it could be anything from seeing your friends uh, tonight we're working together to I haven't seen you for a week. Uh, and it was very consistently like that. So our days were 16 to 20 hour days easy uh, between PT, uh, the incidents that you have to deal with when you're on shift as a police officer, and then the uh, meticulous paperwork that has to be exactly correct afterwards. Um, so now do you think that lack of uh, unit cohesion because of everyone being uh, broken up and doing different things, do you think that affected the way that the unit ran um, as far as if it ran like well or poor in your opinion? So in, in my opinion, and this is uh, something that I've voiced my concern to them a few times, and by them I mean my immediate uh, leadership about issues that were kind of out of our control. So like I said before, we had one battalion of MPs there at Fort Bragg. 
I think because of our job, because of our MOS, uh, it has to be like that. It has to be broken up like that. However, I think if there was another battalion of MPs at Fort Bragg, it would have been a lot different. It would have been, instead of platoons in a company barely making the main requirements on different shifts and having to call people in, we could have one battalion in law enforcement operations and one battalion in uh, training and field cycles. Uh, and that was something that I brought to the Sergeant Major's attention on my way out of the Army when he sat down and was asking me what would I improve if I could improve anything. I think that would have made a, a world of difference because it's hard to send people to promotion boards and soldier boards that you need to get uh, promoted to the non-commissioned officer slots when you're divided between 16 to 20 hour work days, balancing your family life, you know, without having to make large sacrifices that actually, you know, not just giving up your free time, but giving up time with family um, to, to proceed. Um, so you were talking about uh, the field. Um, how did you enjoy going out to the field and things of that nature? I enjoy the field uh, probably more than anything else in the Army. I always had told myself that I was going to go combat arms going into the Army because I wanted to do the hua hua kick indoors things. And the only thing that stopped me from signing a contract without a bonus for like Ford Observer or Infantry uh, was is that my dad always told me that you need to take a skill away from the Army. You know, you don't know if you're going to get injured. You don't know if you're going to do the whole 20. You need to take away some type of skill you can uh, translate to the civilian world. And something that might potentially give you college credit hours on your joint transcripts. And so that's why I ended up doing MP uh, ultimately. However, the field cycle was my inner tactician coming out. Um, more often times than not, with our OCs watching us, I was making on-the-spot corrections of squad leaders and team leaders uh, that were in E5 and E6 positions. And uh, not so much in a, ha-ha, I told you so immature manner, but it just made me shine because I was able to go up to an NCO and say, hey sergeant, we're under fire, why don't we do this action instead? And the sergeant was able to take credit for it and pass it down to me if they were a good NCO on that field cycle. But it made me feel really proud that I was being useful and that I could have that reactionary, consistently response to those scenarios. Um, so now, going back to the whole uh, military police officer aspect, uh, were there any certain cases that really stuck with you, um, either for the good or for the bad? There were. There were good cases and there were bad cases. Uh, like any law enforcement officer, military police or civilian police, there were rewarding cases, um, not to cite names or dates specifically, but there were cases that we were able to take uh, pedophiles and child molesters off the street and prosecute them. And then there are other cases, uh, such as suicide on scene cases, uh, you know, that stick with you the rest of your life. Uh, but not everything was so bad or good. There's in between funny moments you have, too. And uh, to cite a case of that was as I showed up at a barracks one night for a call, and a soldier that knowingly knew that we were there at the door and we were going to come into his barracks room because he was uh, smoking spice, jumped out of the second story of his barracks window. Uh, high on spice and uh, broke his leg trying to run away from us um, but the part that kind of gets the dark humor and the sense of humor but the kind of in between good and bad comes into play where he was high on spice so he didn't feel it and the funny part was is after he jumped out of his window knowingly we'd catch him after he broke his leg he was crawling away in a kind of military low crawl style while screaming F you up at the window at us um, so that's something that, for the good or the bad, has, has definitely stuck with me. It's still a story I tell today to uh, cadets at my current university that are trying to branch military police officer. Um, is there any other certain uh, police cases that you wish to elaborate on? Um, if you don't, it's you know perfectly uh, normal. Not, not any that really come to mind. I, I it would be be unprofessional of me to go ahead and tell you all these cases and these stories back after back after back. I have plenty of funny stories that I ran into. I've had plenty of uh, horrible shifts, nightmare things that happened, and I've got plenty of rewarding uh, why being a military police officer was the right choice for me in the first place type of stories. Okay.
Um, so, uh, now you said you had uh, the stipend, so you didn't have to eat at the barracks, but did you, at, or at the barracks, at the defect, did you ever eat at the defect at all, though? I did. I, I did enjoy eating at the defect that was uh, open to us for a short amount of time. Um, it was a good place for me to take soldiers to that were new to the unit, especially if they were in my team or not. Uh, just to get them acclimated, sit down and have a, a type of informal interview with them over breakfast to get to know who they were, what their background was, what they expected out of the Army, what they knew, what they wanted to know, and kind of sit down with soldiers that we were getting and say, give me two long-term goals and two short-term goals. And it was just a very friendly environment to be in because here we are surrounded by soldiers you know, from all different MOSs and different types of jobs. So we can be open in, in, in truly discussing what we want to discuss and not have to watch what we're saying. All right. Uh, before we move on to the next topic, uh, was there any particular leader or a team, like, you know, soldier that was stationed with you that really stuck out, that, you know, really helped inspire you in any way? So when you ask for an inspiration, um, and an inspiration to thrive to be like, or an inspiration to not be like, and what the wrong example would be? You can use both. Okay, um, let me give you an example of uh, two leaders and how they're on the exact opposite ends of the spectrum here. Um, I'll first, I'll go ahead and I'll tell you the good. The good leader uh, that I always looked up to, that I always knew had the right answer um, even when I had to show that I knew the right answer uh, in front of other soldiers was a staff sergeant by the name of Staff Sergeant Michael Stupar. Staff Sergeant Stupar was an inspiration to me because he always had an answer for something. He was able to improvise there on the spot. If he didn't know, he didn't say, I don't know, guys, you know, it, it's, it's done, it's over, we don't know what to do. There was, it was that, re, it goes back to the, kind of that reactionary. Um, of course, we had a lot of uh, preventive training and knowledge to prevent things from happening so we wouldn't have to be so reactionary all the time. But even when those holy crap moments happened, uh, whether it be in law enforcement in the field, however, and they will happen, there was always a, an, a, a plan of action of, okay, we need to get control of the situation, you need to do this, you need to do this, and that was just very inspiring to me. This man, Always had his paperwork in line, on time, stayed with his soldiers for as long as he needed, um, sacrificing time with his family if need be, would meet up on his free time, always had a good block of instruction for soldiers, and he wasn't necessarily always by the rules, rules, laws, and regulations as much as seeing a gray area in between when it was necessary to deal with situations as far as uh, soldiers and fractions. So if a soldier committed a uh, an action, an unlawful order or something um, that broke regulation, we he wouldn't go straight to jumping to, well, we need to give this guy an Article 15, which could potentially drop him in rank or chapter him out of the Army. Uh, however, we can't let this slide for the good well-being of law and order. So, you know, let's, let's do X in between uh, to solve this. You know, let's go ahead and... We're going to make you put on full kit and, you know, I'm going to make you run and run and run with me and you'll learn your lesson that way, uh, which is very much sometimes how you need to reach out and touch soldiers in order to get uh, lessons instilled in their head. And then we have on the opposite end of the spectrum an old platoon sergeant uh, by the name of Sergeant First Class Anthony Cassetta. Uh, Anthony Cassetta was the... is the... Uh, not only worst NCO and soldier that I've met in my life, uh, just an overall bad person who left a really big mark in my career. Um, for instance, uh, this platoon sergeant was promoting the wrong idea of leadership inside our platoon. Uh, a few examples, I'm not going to make this just a big hate fest on a soldier, but a few examples of what showed me not to be this type of leader uh, was is he was openly... Uh, uh, hitting on and potential sleeping with a soldier under his command and the soldier was showing her phone and her, the text messages of, of him that he sent around openly uh, to the point where it came to the first sergeant's level and uh, this uh, platoon sergeant blamed the soldier and said the soldier was coming on to him and then she went to his office and supposedly showed a uh, the text messages of what was actually going on and it just made it for a really uh, poisonous environment, whether or not, it, regardless of whether it happened or not, whether or not the accusations were true, 
Um, it made for a really poisonous environment to afterwards uh, while he was being investigated, not being relieved of his command. And then all of a sudden she was making um, you know, military police investigator school and, uh, and was able to leave the unit uh, willingly and freely to go pursue um, higher um, positions in the military police world right after this event happened. So it kind of just made a very bad taste in everybody's mouth about this and kind of was the first red flag of this is who I don't want to be like. And uh, there are many other examples of uh, this NCO promoting just bad things in the workplace saying that certain soldiers um, can't be leaders and can't, who's really breaking equal opportunity policy in the army by saying, if you're not on airborne status anymore, which I wasn't since my injury my arm, um, I can't send you to the promotion board to become an E5 because how would that look for me as an airborne leader, sending somebody who just has their wings and isn't on status uh, in an airborne unit to go proceed to, to get that rank higher. Um, so it really inspired me of more or less what not to be and what not to do in the military. All right. Um, so now transitioning, uh, when you were about ready to leave your uh, Fort Bragg to transition out of the military, what were what kind of feelings were you going through your body? Uh, at first, it was very bitter. Um, bitter. I was very mad about it. Uh, what ended up happening was is that uh, platoon sergeant that I named before. Uh, the couple years that I'd been at Fort Bragg had told me I can't go to the promotion board um, because we had to promote diversity in the workplace and we already had too many white male NCOs. Um, I was told I couldn't go to uh, schools that I wanted and other activities. I couldn't pursue really to move anywhere. And uh, my, my argument was is that I had no negative counseling so my counseling packets, no bad actions against me, no... I'd never broke any regs or anything like that, and I looked very good uh, on paper and PT-wise. I, uh, besides the push-up that I couldn't perform uh, within the PT world uh, that I was exempt from, I scored perfect scores every single time, 100% um, on my runs and my sit-ups. Uh, so my argument was is that I need to be able to, to grow and pursue. So once I found out that I couldn't move and I was very much in a lateral position and that I was not going to advance, um, that's when I started talking to my doctors about they had already targeted me for uh, uh, what we call an MEB or med board chapter pa uh, paper um, package. So I had fought the med board uh, twice before where the army said, you're getting kicked out of the army because your arm's messed up. And I was able to fight it twice and stay in. And this third time, they were kind of, uh, everybody on post was being reviewed by Womack Army Hospital that was on some type of permanent profile which was a piece of paper stating that I couldn't jump and I couldn't do push-ups because of my arm being messed up. And they were automatically being reviewed. In my case, had come up uh, positive for an MEB chapter. So I had gotten called in to WOMAC to talk to them and discuss uh, potentially being chaptered. And at that point, I decided not to fight it and just let them decide whether or not I was going to get chaptered. In the end, they decided yes because of this. I was awarded a... Um, combat related injury um, identifier because it was on an airborne operation for my arm um, that had been going on. Alright, um, so how did you end up returning home? Did, was it, you know, you were here, still here stateside, so did you have to fly home? Did you um, drive? So or? what I ended up doing was making uh, the state of Georgia my new home. I had been going to school and living in Cincinnati, Ohio uh, for most of my life and my girlfriend of three years at the time had been going to the University of North Georgia and I had a uh, battle buddy from OSIT training that also had been going to the University of North Georgia so I've been very familiar with the area. Uh, she was just about to finish her bachelor's degree and she did and so at the time she was in her last semester so I decided it would be best if I moved to um, Dahlonega, Georgia at the University of North Georgia and uh, spend my time transitioning to here. Um, the day that I left Fort Bragg, I was staying at a, a friend's house to clear, because I had to clear my barracks room. I packed my four-door sedan completely full, completely full. There was zero space in that sedan, um, even really for me to drive. And uh, I ended up packing my car completely and even downloading the items I couldn't fit and uh, driving off to Dahlonega, Georgia. Um, so... 
Now, what did your family feel about, you know, you coming down here instead of moving back home? Uh, so my father's uh, opinions on this was that uh, if it's what's best for me, then that's what I need to do. He'd understood. He had originally lived in California, in Southern California, and moved uh, here to Kentucky, or to Kentucky and Cincinnati area. And uh, so he had told me, this is what's best for you, then that's what you need to do, uh, which I felt and do still feel was the best move for me, uh, transitioning into a military college like I did. Uh, my mother, on the other hand, uh, of course, was not happy about it whatsoever and wanted me to, has always wanted me to move home to the area of uh, Cincinnati and Kentucky again and pursue higher education there and wasn't happy in the first place about me leaving for the Army. Okay. Um, so, now, with that being said, how about the community around? Um, so, you said it's a uh, very military friendly community. Um, have they done anything for you since they've been back or is it just you kind of fell back yeah. in line and just kind of put it all in the past? So my good and bad experiences in the Army, going back to that platoon sergeant, my injury, and the connections I made in the Army with the good leaders and my friends and all that really matured me and allowed me to grow a lot while I was in. I've used every skill almost besides combat skills that I've learned in the Army since I've transitioned out. The community has been very open and welcome. Uh, right down the street from us here in Dahlonega, Georgia, is uh, is a ranger camp, Camp Merrill, which is the uh, mountain phase of ranger school. So this community is very heavily oriented on military. Uh, this community is either really, for the most part, uh, rangers, uh, retired rangers and military, or uh, the cadets and students up here at the University of North Georgia. Uh, immediately, as soon as I got here, I got involved with uh, veteran groups and activities, and I immediately, my first semester here, last semester in the fall of 2016, became the vice president for our SVA, or Student Veterans of America, program that's here, and I'm now still currently the vice president, and I'm the president-elect for our next semester, so I've been very active as far as getting out and, uh, and reaching out to the community here. We did a project where we uh, did yard work for a disabled veteran, a retired veteran here in the community. And it's just very rewarding to be able to do that and to spend time with those veterans and hear their stories and hear um, their tales about the wars that they were involved with or what they did in garrison. Um, so how are you adjusting to uh, civilian life? Uh, I would say uh, almost excellently. Um, I was very nervous transitioning. I'm very much a social butterfly. I love people. I love my buddies. I didn't want to leave them behind. I had very much felt like when I was getting um, the medical chapter, even though I'd served three and a half years, I was leaving my friends behind. Um, so that was something that really bothered me for a while. However, once I got out um, and started kind of, I had a, a summer to adjust doing some side jobs here and there as far as yard work and things go. Um, once I got into school, I, I, I loved it. It was almost a 180 from high school. I, um, not to say that I wasn't a good student in high school, it's over, it's just I cared more. Uh, I was very much more focused and oriented on my education and learning and bothering my professors outside of class. And the university is small enough where all my professors know me my first name, so it's very easy to leave a good impression on my professors that I'm this um, enthusiastic about learning and, and picking up new skills that it allows me to have uh, research opportunities and, and things along those lines. Yeah. Uh, now, do you remain in contact with uh, people that you were stationed with? Absolutely. Um, although a lot of us are in different parts of the world, um, the few that I consider to be my very good friends while I was in, even if they were in different companies, I still keep in contact with uh, my buddy Scott Kerber, who went through OSIT training with me, served at Fort Bragg with me in a different company. Uh, he's currently stationed overseas right now. We still keep in very good contact. Um, my friend Lucas Schroeder, uh, him and I keep in almost bi-daily contact with each other um, and really keep each other's uh, spirits up high when we, having, when we have those hard or rough periods of adjustment it's you know we can talk to each other and say hey you know this is how I got through this I experienced the same thing uh, the same thing with my friend Tate Doolum he's still currently serving at Fort Bragg 
Uh, he's planning on getting out, staying uh, locally in that area. We're still in very good contact. Old squad leaders, old leaders, old platoon leaders, um, old commanders uh, that have PCS and gone on to different installations around the country, uh, I'm still very much in contact with and still am held in high regards with them. All right. So um, you said you were doing some... Uh you know, minor work before you started school, but other than school, is there anything you've done since separating from the military? Uh, since my separation was as recently as not even a year ago, um, I would say accomplishments of mine have just been my activities associated with school. Um, I was able to go ahead and hit the ground running per se and uh, make above a 3.0 my first semester back, and I currently have all A's um, here my second semester, my freshman year, my first year. And uh, I've been involved with uh, groups such as the Psychology Club, um, the Student Veterans of America. We're, I'm actually leading the fight to have the school open up a uh, honors uh, veterans fraternity here and uh, other veteran-friendly programs. I'm looking to really make a, a 180 impact on the school here on um, the way that it views and treats its veterans. Right. Um, other than the SVA, are you currently any member of any other veterans association? Uh, yeah, so we're looking at st uh, starting a um, Northeast Atlanta chapter of Red, White, and Blue, which is a spinoff of Vets Atlanta. Uh, what they do is they organize a lot of uh, fundraiser events uh, and charity events for uh, veterans in the community locally here in Georgia. And uh, what they focus really on is doing like a 5K, 10K ruck marches and runs in order to raise the funds to support these veterans. So it's not anything like a, uh, a sales pitch or a private company or anything like that. It's very much a charitable uh, organization. And I'm actually looking to uh, try to start that as the president and not the founder, but the leader of our chapter here in Northeast Georgia. Okay. Um, so... What were some of your, the life lessons that the military has taught you? Oh, the military taught me um, a lot, actually. Uh, to keep it shorter, the military taught me the leadership skills that I was, uh, you know, I referred to earlier about what to do and what not to do, uh, what makes a good leader, what makes not a good leader. Um, it really taught me to take initiative. Uh, that's something that I've noticed since I've been out with, working with a lot of civilians and even with other veterans who uh, are in the National Guard and the Reserves and didn't have that day-to-day -day, uh, initiative checks almost while they were in the Army or in the military, uh, regardless of branch, um, was is that in put towards situations where people don't want to make decisions or can't make decisions, whether it's a split decision moment or a, a week-long way of how are we going to handle a situation, I'm very much able to step up and say, you know what, not to be the guy to bully everybody and say this is what we're doing, but let's take part of your idea, let's take part of your idea, and take part of my idea, and we'll combine them into something, and I'll move forward with it. I'll go talk to who needs to get talked to. Uh, I'll step forward, and I'll take that, that leadership position. And uh, responsibility and patience. A lot of patience with paperwork. Um, so now how's your military impact? Or your military service impacted your feelings about war or the military in general? Uh, my experiences in the military um, are very biased in the fact that I was interacting with very many, a wide variety of people, right? Um, so day-to-day -day military police operations, I could uh, be working with anybody from uh, a Green Beret in group, and then what's going on in that police call to uh, 44th Medical to anybody. So I have a lot of positive experiences in networking with people that I met and, and learning off of them. Um, however, I mean... <laughs> I mean, so has it just, you know, changed your perspective on the military from before you went in? Yeah, it, like I said before, it's very biased, and it's hard for me to openly say this, but amongst a lot of veterans and amongst a lot of service members who I was still in, um, it was often discussed that even in the short amount of time that I was in the Army with three and a half years, um, things were def definitely getting a little too politically correct. Uh, people were passing 
uh, their own standards and not the standards that the Army traditionally sets forth uh, for certain schools, jobs, uh, and, and such forth. And I saw a lot of uh, favoritism going in. I went into it with the uh, Hollywood mindset of like what you see in Band of Brothers and you know other uh, documentaries and uh, HBO series and things like that and talking to previous veterans of how things are. So not just the Hollywood aspect, but all these stories from all these veterans. And then just seeing how easy it was, um, even from the time that I am and the easier that it got and just the, the favoritism, didn't entirely ruin my aspect or my uh, view of the military as a whole. By no means am I saying the, the uh, military, the army as a whole is, is a bunch of care bearers and ACUs. However, uh, I do, I would like to say that in very many aspects, it's like America right now in 2017, that a lot of things are very political. And it was, I know no matter where you go, things are going to be political in, in workplaces and schools and, and all that, but it was much more political than I thought it was going to be. <clears throat> now, uh, what message would you like to leave for future generations who view or hear your interview? Go forward with a clear mind. Be able to hear the opposition side of the argument. Do not just be entirely one-sided. Or else, nobody's no progression is ever going to be made. Nobody's ever going to put their foot forward if... Uh, you, you and another party or another idea are just uh, at an impasse there. Um, so I would say looking forward, you be yourself. Shut up and listen, even if you think you know what the answer is. Take in as much information as you can. Reflect on yourself and try to network and build yourself. And, and always try to become a, a, bigger, a bigger and better asset. It, there's always room to improve. There's always, you know, I'm really strong in this area, I'm really poor in this area, and I'm working on this area, but don't let that area you're good in go down as well. You know, you have to uh, maintain, and very many skills are perishable. So if there's a skill that's important that you need to retain, you consistently need to be using it in practice. That's what I would say. All right. Um, is there anything you feel that we haven't discussed or that you wish to add to the interview? Absolutely not. I think we covered uh, all the bases here, and uh, thank you very much for making the journey down here and conducting this interview with me. All right. Thank you for your time.